you know, when you talk to the people on the streets in Iran, they are willing to see this to the very, very end. They don't see any kind of hope, as I say, or compromise. They really and truly believe that this fight either ends with the end of the regime or with their deaths, and they're willing to go that far. What could go right? I'm Zachary Carabell, the founder of the Progress Network, and I'm joined as always by Emma Varvalukas, the executive director of the Progress Network. And we are having in our season three, a series of conversations with people who are looking at the world through a different lens than the daily deluge of dystopian data. And that is all in the service of the sensibility that we bring to the world, the lens through which we view the world intimately shapes what we think about what's going on and what we think is possible. And if we are all collectively mired in that despair or doom scrolling or Armageddon, it becomes harder and harder to see our way to a future that we want to create and not the future that we fear we are constructing. And I say this every week and I'm going to keep saying it because I think it bears repeating. Look, I don't have any answers. Emma doesn't have any answers per se. I'm just one guy with an opinion. And we are simply an agglomeration of people who have their own view of the world. But I think we owe it to all of us. We owe it to ourselves to try to see the world through different eyes than we might be seeing it to say, hey, is our conception of everything being chaotic and heading downhill, is that true? Is that right? And even if it is true, what do you then do? Do you give into it or do you try to change it? And there's a whole lot of giving into it and there's a whole lot of belief that things are getting worse in many parts of the world, not just the United States. I'm sure if we were having this conversation in Portuguese about the recent Brazilian election, there'd be the same dynamics of roiling discontent, um, particularly given that it was a highly contested election between Lula and Bolsonaro. So this is kind of a global issue, not just a, an American issue. Uh, although we are, you know, I'm an American, I was an American in Athens, uh, we have that bent. So that's the shtick and that's what we're trying to do week by week, day by day, and what we're trying to do with the Progress Network. Uh, and today we're gonna talk with somebody who has certainly been in the mix and been in the fray and had his own jousting with mm -hmm. ideas he dislikes and people <laughs> that he dislikes as well. But his most recent book is, a, I think, a bit of a step back and a, a look at the way the world might have been. Iran has been much in the news because of the, the, the protests there, this time led initially and largely by women protesting the kind of repressive social mores and sclerotic regime. And Reza Aslan, who we'll talk to today, has been in the fray for the past 20 plus years. I've known him for a long time. He's written a lot about Islam. He's written a lot about relations between the United States and the Middle East, as well as a whole series of other things. And his, his most recent book really looks at a time uh, where at least one American worked with uh, a series of Iranian revolutionaries to, to maybe change the arc of history at the beginning of the 20th century, which is obviously quite relevant at the beginning of the 21st. And then after we talk to Reza, Em and I will look at some of the news of the week that may have gotten less attention that we think should have gotten more attention. Right, Emma? So That's tell right. us about Reza. So Reza Aslan is a leading expert in world religions. He's a writer, professor, and an Emmy and Peabody nominated producer. He's the winner of the prestigious James Joyce Award. Um, and as Zachary mentioned, he's the author of three internationally bestselling books, including the number one New York Times bestseller, Zealot, the Life and Times of Jesus of Nazareth. His producing credits include the HBO series, The Leftovers. He's the co-host of the podcast, Metaphysical Milkshake. And as Zachary mentioned, we're going to be talking to him a little bit about his new book and some other things today, which is called An American Martyr in Persia, which looks at the life of Howard Baskerville. He died fighting in Iran's constitutional revolution in the early 20th century. Reza, welcome to the Waka Gorai podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And uh, we're looking forward to reading your new book. Definitely, it's coming out at a very interesting time when Iran is very much so in the news. I wonder, actually, if you could just give us a brief look at how 
you see what's going on in Iran now, uh, the uprisings that are going on? Is there something different here? Is there something particular that you are paying attention to um, that maybe others might not have heard in the media or elsewhere? And just, yeah, give us your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I can say with confidence, I've never seen anything like this. I lived through a revolution in Iran in 79, and I've been watching Iran over the last four and a half decades, where we've seen countless uprisings and demonstrations, not just sort of the the big massive ones that we remember from 2009 and 2019, but even actually in the last six or eight months, there had been pretty large scale protests that were taking place um, across Iran, factory workers, farm workers, uh, retirees, school children, people who would come out to protest the government's handling of the deteriorating economic condition. But the death of the Iranian Kurdish woman, Masa Jinnah Amini, um, uh, a little more than a month ago now, has lit a kind of fuse in that country that I've never seen before. Protests have been sweeping across Iran since September when the 22-year-old died in the custody of the country's morality police. Now demonstrators are calling for regime change, posing one of the biggest challenges to the republic's clerical leadership since the Iranian revolution in 1979. Partly it has to do with the fact that Gen Z, who is really leading this revolution, um, seems to have a completely different uh, relationship with the government. They're not interested in any kind of conversations about reform or changes. They are united in the call for the end of this regime. Partly it has to do with the fact that this is clearly a feminist uprising. It's being led by women, sparked by women. And, you know, women, despite what I think a lot of outsiders think about Iran, um, which, of course, has like, you know, disgusting uh, gender inequality, Women have always been at the forefront of the major movements in Iran, the major revolutions in Iran, going back more than a century. And partly, I just think that it's this feeling of utter desperation. You know, when you talk to the people on the streets in Iran, they are willing to see this to the very, very end. They don't see any kind of hope, as I say, or compromise. They really and truly believe that this fight either ends with the end of the regime or with their deaths, and they're willing to go that far. And at the same time, the regime itself is absolutely uncompromising in its response. So we have these two forces, neither of which are willing to give an inch. And both of them seem to be really hunkering down, you know, for a long, long conflict. And that's really how these revolutions go. I always remind people that the 1979 revolution started in 1977. You know, we're barely two months into this conflict. And I think it's going to get much, much worse. But I do at the same time feel more optimistic and more hopeful than ever that this regime will finally fall and that Iran will finally be free. You know, we, I th- we talked about this a little bit uh, in one of our earlier episodes about Russia. The thing about authoritarian regimes, right, is that they seem absolutely inviolable and permanent until the moment that <laughs> right. they disintegrate, right? And I think the challenge of Iran over the past 10 years is there have been each of these kind of moments where you thought something was going to give around the time of the Arab Spring with Khatami. You know, there's been a whole false starts that the regime has done very well. I mean, if you're if you're part of the regime, they've done a good job mm-hmm. for stalling change, right? Um, and I think that's kind of an open question. I I'm fascinated that you chose the topic you chose, and part of it is I'm acutely aware of kind of your own career arc, and um, certainly this book uh, about Howard Baskerville and, and 1907 and 1909 in Iran is, you know, it's less overtly polemical than some of what you've done over the past decade plus. Mm-hmm. Um, it's more elegiac, right? It's it's kind of a look at a time. I mean, I get, you know, I'm supposed narcissistically reading in my own sensibility to it. I once wrote a book about the building of the Suez Canal, and I wrote a book about Muslim, Christian, and Jewish coexistence. And those were both stories in some way about, you know, alternate paths of where East and West or Muslim and Christian or different cultures could work more constructively together rather than work at odds with one another. 
And I'm just curious what the genesis was. Is this, is this a story you've wanted to tell and other things interceded and now is the time to tell it? Have you, in the normal arc of your own life, are you sort of also taking a step back and looking at what could have been and not just what is? So where did this come from? Yeah, it's a lot of those things. Yeah, on the, this is a story that I've known pretty much all my life and, and a story that I've wanted to tell. Um, it was difficult because... It's been 115 years, and there really wasn't that much information about Howard Baskerville. You know, basically what people knew about him, what what few people who had ever written about him has all pretty much been the same. He was a 22-year-old Christian missionary from Nebraska. He went to Iran. Back then, it was known as Persia in 1907 in order to teach and preach the gospel, and he ended up fighting and dying in Iran's first revolution uh, against the Shah. And that's pretty much it. <laughs> and so even when I took on the task of writing this book, I have to be honest, I was very nervous about how little information there was. I thought, am I writing a pamphlet? Is that what's happening here? <laughs> but I really did get lucky in that I found a treasure trove of information in Persian sources um, and in Russian sources. The Russians obviously had a very important role to play in Iran at the time. And then also in the Presbyterian Historical Archives. And for the first time, you know, this historical character who had been really only known by these few actions that he took at the end of his life became a three-dimensional person. And I was able to really place him in this incredibly dramatic time and place, the first democratic revolution in the Middle East. And... I, the the story that came out of it, I think the thing that was most surprising is how resonant it is with today at a time, not just in which we have, you know, young Iranians on the street yet again, clamoring for the same rights that Baskerville died trying to defend, you know, a century ago, but also in the fact that, you know, we're at a time in which democracy is in retreat around the world, where the very idea of democracy promotion will get you laughed out of the room. You know, we're not all that fond of democracy in the United States anymore, let alone, you know, de democracy elsewhere. And yet here's this 22 year old kid, right? Who a century ago had a belief in the idea of democracy, the notion that people should be free to have a say in the decisions that rule their lives, that he was willing to die for it. And die for someone else's democracy, right? Not even for his own. It was such an inspiring story. And it always has been an inspiring story. But now more than ever, I just think about where we are in the world and what Howard Baskerville um, says about, you know, the current situation in which we find ourselves. You talk in the book about um, there's a statue of, of Baskerville in Tabriz today, right? Yeah. Yeah, there's a tomb and, and, uh, and a kind of this beautiful golden bust of him. Yeah. And that that, you know, since 1979 remains a place where people go and kind of give a uh, genuflect to the memory. Well, before, and, before 79, before 79, 70. No, no, but meaning, meaning even the revolution, that the revolution didn't reverse that. I mean, there oh, was no, yeah. so my, my point is like, what was touching about that was, you have this kind of uh, mutual animosity society between the regime in Iran and the right, and to some degree, a lot of the American foreign policy establishment. The Iranians demonize the United States as the great Satan and, you know, death to America, not death to Americans per se, but death to America. As a, mm -hmm. And we kind of make Iran into this existential, oh my God, they're going to, you know, use nuclear weapons or whatever it is, or they're a theocracy, which they are. And yet, even with the revolution, you have this American in Tabriz, I mean, a, a historical figure that's still honored. And I think it's, it's, it, it's a way of pointing to, there's this kind of top line narrative, you know, we all hate each other. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then there's this lived reality, which is much more um, yeah. embraceive and accepting and complicated. Yeah, I mean, look, anyone who's been to Iran will tell you that it's probably the most poor American population, certainly in the Middle East, maybe even the world. <laughs> Partly that has to do with the fact that the, the government, the Iranian government, which the people almost universally loathe, 
you know, sees America as its primary opponent. And so as a result of that, Iranians have come to love American culture and music and TV and movies and books and all of those things. Certainly, you know, they're uh, very clear eyed about American foreign policy and the disaster that it has wrought, um, not just in the wider Middle East, but specifically in Iran. But they have the ability to make the distinction between the government and the people in a way that we in America aren't as good at, I would have to say. But even in the run up to the 1979 revolution, it was fascinating that there were all these calls by Iranian revolutionaries and activists for a new generation of Baskervilles. You would hear this all the time. Where are the Baskervilles of today? Even then, you know, 70 years after his death, there was still this legacy that represented what America is supposed to stand for, right? The values and uh, the morals that it kind of ascribes to itself, but rarely puts in play when it comes to foreign policy. Now, I will say, I, I do think it is important to note that really since 1979, his memory has pretty much faded in Iran. I mean, I'd say it's difficult to find anyone under the age of 50 who knows who Howard Baskerville is. Um, mm. My friends in Iran tell me that there uh, there is a um, like a chain of very popular coffee shops in uh, Tehran called Baskerville. But I can't imagine anybody who is in there sipping lattes knows anything about the, the person who this coffee shop is named after. Oh, it must strike them as like a, you know, how did this name come about? You know, someone right. sitting in there one day. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. that, sounds, that sounds interesting. Um, so, you know, his name is still there. And certainly in Tabriz, obviously, the city in which he's buried and, and the city in which he lived, there's a, a fonder memory of him. But that was one of my goals was was to resurrect uh, his memory in Iran to remind Iranians of what America actually can be when we actually, you know, put our ideas and our beliefs into practice. And also to sort of I mean, you, you know, he's been forgotten in, in Iran, but he was never remembered in America to, to begin with. And and that's the other thing, too, is to make sure that Americans understood um who this kid was and and why his story needs to be told. Yeah, Reza, exactly on that point. Can you give us just a, you know, a brief um, history lesson here? Because I imagine a lot of people listening, I mean, so, you know, especially if you're Iranian, you don't even know maybe, but especially <laughs> people for people listening, right. what was going on in Persia at the time that Baskerville yeah. was, was there? So in 1905, um, a band of young revolutionaries poured out into the streets of Tehran they were backed by business interests and by the clerical establishment. And they were they demanded a constitution, uh, a document that would outline the rights and privileges of all citizens in the country and the creation of a parliament, uh, an elected body that would have the ability to pass legislation and to curb the unchecked authority of the Shah. It took a couple of years of, you know, uh, strikes and protests and bloodshed, but they finally achieved both those goals. The, the Shah of Iran allowed for uh, an elected parliament and for a constitution, a very progressive document, in fact. But then the Shah died and his son, who was incensed at, you know, the idea that his what he viewed as his God given authority could be curbed, um, declared war on the constitutionalists and the revolution descended into a civil war. One that the Shah with his Russian trained, Russian armed, Russian funded and Russian commanded uh, military uh, easily uh, began to win. And in fact, by, 19, oh, by the end of 1907, the beginning of 1908, the Shah had regained control of every city in Iran except for Tabriz. Um, which became the kind of last bastion of the revolutionaries, where the revolutionaries made their last stand. And this was when, you know, suddenly this 22-year-old Christian missionary from Nebraska showed up. <laughs> and um, he had been sent there by the Presbyterian Church to teach English and history, and obviously to preach the gospel. And he almost immediately became... Uh, immersed in this revolutionary movement. Um, and it's hard to 
it's not hard to figure out why he he did. I mean, it, it was you know this was an incredibly exciting moment. This was at the time the the most robust anti-imperialist revolution, and in fact, it had drawn in revolutionaries from all over the world. There were Russians and Georgians and Armenians and Turks, and Jews and Christians and Zoroastrians and Baha'is and Buddhists. It was this incredible multi-religious, multi-ethnic, multinational revolutionary force that had come together to fight for the freedom of Iran against the Shah. And it took a while. Um, and, you know, he was repeatedly told by the school that he where he taught and the church that sent him there and the U.S. government that he was to have nothing to do with this fight. But the devastation of the city, the suffering of the people, the oppression of the Shah began to just weigh on him. And in 1909, after about a year and a half of, of being there and trying his best to kind of put his head down and ignore what was going on, he quit his teaching job, gave up his missionary post, ultimately abandoned his American citizenship and joined the revolution and uh, ended up dying in a fight to free the city from uh, the Shah's blockade and bring food to the city. But his death really galvanized the revolutionaries. It became kind of a an international embarrassment that allowed um, the revolutionaries the opportunity to actually break through the siege and march on Tehran and send the Shah into exile and reestablish the constitution, rebuild the parliament, hold new elections. And the, one of the very first acts of that parliament was to declare this you know, young Christian missionary from the Midwest to be a national hero a martyr in the cause of Iranian freedom. And, you know, Iran was very, for a very brief time, a constitutional monarchy. And then the First World War happened, the devastation of that conflict and the, the post-war chaos and economic uh, destruction paved the way for a military coup, uh, which then resulted in a new uh, Iranian dynasty, the Pahlavi dynasty, which for people who are familiar with modern Iran, that's the dynasty that was ultimately overthrown in 1979 that led to the Islamic Republic that we now know. So can I get a little uh, historical wonky question in a moment? Yeah. Which is <laughs> there, you know, from like 1900 to about 1920, there's a series of constitutional movements throughout uh, countries that are either controlled by European countries or threatened by them. So you have that in Turkey, you have it uh, with the, you know, with the young Turks and with the young Ottomans before mm -hmm. the young Turks, you have it in Egypt, um, with the Waf party, you have it in, uh, Vietnam or what was then, uh, uh Indochina. So you have a kind of a China, and, and uh, Mexico, China, you Sun got Russia, even, right. you know, Russia. Yeah. And, right. Russia prior to the 1917 yeah. revolution, almost all of which end, uh, badly, right. Yeah. I don't think a single one of those becomes <laughs> a constitutional democracy or even something anywhere close they're usually repressed there's some version of what happened in iran this is a kind of an impossible question but i'm really interested to hear your thoughts because you've thought about it like what do you think explains that like why was there this sort of interrupted you know path that seemed very promising in a lot of the world and then by the 1920s is been violently set back well, the easy answer is the war to end all wars. <laughs> like, that's the easy answer, right? I mean, I think sometimes we we forget the earth-shattering devastation of that war and what it left behind in, you know, large parts of the globe um, and the instability that arose out of that, um, you know, that global conflict. But the longer and more complex answer, the more wonky answer, if you will, is that constitutionalism, which was a very new idea at the time, was very hard to kind of define in any, in any kind of, you know, universal way, right? It, it meant different things to different people. For some, it, it meant popular sovereignty and uh, and elected, you know, bodies that could make legislation. But for others, it meant freedom from foreign interference. For others, it meant, you know, upward economic mobility. For some, it meant just, you know, equitable taxation. And 
On the one hand, the fact that it was such a malleable term was part of its strength, right? It could mean many things to different people. And so people were able to kind of unite together across um, cultural lines, across political lines, economic lines, and unite under a common cause, constitutionalism. On the other hand, <laughs> when you actually achieve that goal, then suddenly all of these disparate groups with different ideas about what was to come out of this revolutionary fight all get a voice. And the result is, as we've come to realize when it comes to you know democratic societies, uh, gridlock. <laughs> you know, you're just kind of frozen in place. And when you think about the response that was necessary in the post-war period, gridlock was the last thing that people needed. This was certainly the case in Iran. You know, there was a humanitarian crisis you know, uh, that was taking place in that country and one in which the parliament with its infighting and its, you know, political fractures just simply couldn't respond to. And that paved the way for a strong man to come in and basically get rid of the elected body um, and return the country back to autocracy. So I think it's a combination of both, but it's really hard to ignore what World War I did to populations around the world. I think that's a great point. Um, and then it raises the question, <clears throat> hundred and you know three years later, right? Mm -hmm. After the end of World War I, history rhymes, you know, it doesn't repeat itself and trying to find the perfect pattern to apply to the present is a fool's errand. But does that legacy of the past make you more concerned about our arc in the present. Um, you know, it's nice to think, and I certainly am a card carrying member of those who think the following that history is kind of a back and forth contest between our incredible ability to create and our unbelievable capacity to destroy, but at least we're having the conversation, which means <laughs> the creative part of it's narrowly inched out the destructive part of it. But you know, so past far. performance is no guarantee <laughs> yeah. of the future. So like, where do you, where does this make you stand or does it not, you know, per se, make you stand anywhere different than you did? Does it make you more hopeful, less hopeful about the same? I mean, look, it, it is, when you look at the history that we just discussed and you look at the present moment, a moment of existential crisis, right? And you try to think about the way in which democratic societies have responded to this crisis and you see you know what's happening in the united states with two-thirds of americans now saying that american democracy is under immediate threat of di total disintegration yeah it's very hard to be positive it's very hard not to be afraid that we are as you rightly say uh, about to approach one of these moments of contraction if you will and that's certainly happening around the world. It's not just here in the United States. Um, you know, the pollsters tell us that uh, democracy is in a situation that it hasn't been since before the, the fall of the Berlin Wall. At the same time, I do think that, and maybe it's misplaced, but I have a sense of hope in this younger generation that seems sort of unconcerned with the the conflicts and the you know the the divides that you know our generation <laughs> has been so obsessed with that has led to the you know the situation in which we're in now and this is especially true when it comes to the climate catastrophe that we're all facing i just feel like when i look at this younger generation gen z and when i see the way that they have responded to a planet on fire and, you know, civilization on the brink. It gives me some hope that perhaps they can kind of save us all, right? Like we, we've basically done a good job of getting them to the point of, uh, you know, extinction. And maybe, maybe their determination can kind of bring us out of it. It's the same hope that I was talking about, about Iran, right? It's that, yeah, there's been four generations of failed attempts to change this regime, to reform it. I was part of that fight, you know, in the early 2000s, trying to reform um, the Islamic Republic. And this generation has made it absolutely abundantly clear 
they are not interested in reform. They don't care about reform. They don't want more rights. That's not what this fight is for. This fight is for burning the entire thing down and starting all over again. And, you know, we may think that that's unlikely, but I have to say it's inspiring in a way that I think all of the struggles and attempts of my generation to make changes, to make life a little bit better, to to improve the situation slightly, um, make, you know, make the, the, the situation for Iranians just a little more free, that that has been a complete disaster. So, yeah, maybe it is time to burn the whole thing down and start over again. Yeah, no compromises from Gen Z. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I, I, I just can't get over this, but um, maybe one day I will. But for now, I'm still stuck on this, that the first time that I heard the news about the protests in Iran was on TikTok. And there was this weird sense, like it wasn't in, you know, on NBC or something. Um, and there was this weird sense of like, oh, yeah, you guys are on TikTok, too. You know, <laughs> yeah. uh, um, and uh, for me, it just brings up this whole conversation we've been having about Baskerville, who did something pretty unusual um, in that he had one identity that was sort of given to him. And he went and sort of chose to pick up other people's identity and incorporate that into his. And I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about those kinds of issues of identity, of, of mm. belonging to two places at once. You know, people end up doing that in all kinds of different ways. And I know you have personal experience with that. So yeah. I would just love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. In fact, you know, there's this kind of incredible moment at the end of his life where the American consul general in Tabriz tries one last time, right? They've been trying for a while now, but one last time to dissuade him uh, of, uh, from joining this revolution. And he meets him kind of in the training field where, you know, they're all, they're all preparing for battle. And he says to Baskerville in no uncertain terms, this is not your fight. These are not your people. This is not your country. You need to desist from your activities, get back on a ship and go home. And Baskerville kind of looks at this multi-faith, multi-religious, multi-national uh, coalition of revolutionaries, all of them ready to die for the freedom of this country. And he says, the only difference between me and these people is the place of my birth. And that is not a very big difference. And it's astonishing to me that insight, you know, more than a century ago, uh, that nationality, ethnicity, you know, culture, religion, language, these are just these false divides, right? They're these sort of external identities that we use to create uh, in-groups and out-groups. And that the fact of the matter is that underneath all of those things, those sort of fabricated identities, we all pretty much want the same thing, right? We want we want to be free and prosperous and we have the same aspirations and the same dreams that there isn't that much that separates us. And to your point, I think that that's kind of really what's been remarkable about the response of the rest of the world to the conflict in Iran. The media has done an absolutely awful job of uh, covering what is now, I think, hard to deny a fourth revolution taking place in Iran. And, you know, they've got their own issues and reasons why. But it has been now because of social media, Instagram, TikTok, a little bit, you know, of, of Twitter, that we know what's going on. That's how I know what's going on. That's how I follow, you know, the events. I'm not turning on the news to figure out what's going on because it's not there. And I think what we're witnessing now and, and what the sort of this bond is, the reason that we are so kind of glued to these dramatic images is because underneath the different culture and different religion and different nationality, we recognize this desperation that we are sensing, especially from Iranian women, right? Iran isn't the only country in the world that uses women's bodies in order to you know, as a canvas to kind of paint their own sense of morality on it. We <laughs> I mean, certainly we're doing that here in the United States. And when you strip away all those, uh, you know, identity markers, it's really hard not to see yourself, you know, in the young men and women on the streets of Iran fighting for 
you know, their most basic rights. And that, you know, when I was saying earlier that little did I know how resonant, you know, Baskerville's story would be right now. That's, that to me is kind of the biggest part of it is that, that ability to strip yourself of the prejudice of your nationality and the bigotry of your creeds, as the Tabrizi said, and to just recognize the humanity that, that binds us all together. I think uh, that's a great note to end the conversation on, or at least to end this particular chapter of this particular conversation, given that clearly we're going to keep having it. And yeah. none of us know how this current wave is going to crest or end or what its end point is going to be. Um, hopefully this fourth time will be the time when things actually do change. But right now we're in that who knows moment. Yeah, I do want to thank you for the book and the message. And you've had a fascinating career arc to date. I'm sure it will be equally so over the next X number of years. And uh, I look forward to continuing the conversations with you as that happens. Thank you, you guys. Thanks for the, the time. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Wow, that was a intense and in many ways I found moving conversation. Um, you know, there's something about that reflection on stalled moments in the past and potential moments in the present. And truly, we, we may be looking back at this conversation and this moment as yet another, if not tragic, then uh, total failed attempt to change a really problematic regime. But it was, I think, moving to hear him talk about what, what, he, what he had learned from an earlier moment in 1907 to 1909 and, and where that stands now. Yeah, I mean, the message, you know, out from underneath all the history is so powerful. And I'm so happy that he shared that particular quote from Baskerville, the only difference between me and these people is the place of my birth. And that is not a big difference because, you know, reading the book, made me tear up writing it down you know maybe tear up I'm saying it again now and I'm like starting to tear up and <laughs> maybe I'm a sap but I think it just those simple things are so powerful no you should never stop being that sap that kind <laughs> of seriously that sort of emotional empathetic reaction to something deep and profound is vital like without that mm -hmm. you're in that you know, sea of cynicism. It's only one that can really affect you emotionally in a good way, you know, not the outrage part, but the empathy part that uh, we can see our common humanity and navigate our way forward accordingly. Yeah, with an open heart. But uh, also, I'm not crying, you're crying. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's, uh, let's turn to the news of the week. All right, we'll go, we'll go from looking back uh, at the past to plunging ourselves into the present. The good old present. Let's go. Okay. So I have, uh, I think a really good first one it has to do with climate change and the environment. Um, everyone's just kind of used to pretty disastrous news around that, but the international energy agency just came out with new numbers for 2022 and the rise in carbon dioxide emissions. 2021 saw 2 billion ton rise in carbon dioxide emissions, and we were expecting more, even more than that in 2022. But we are actually are only going up 300 million tons 2022. We only went up 300 million as opposed to 2 billion the year before. I'm not going to pretend offhand to know exactly what those tons mean in lay mm -hmm. terms, even though I feel like I should know exactly what they mean in lay terms. But I do get, I think, that... Uh, one seventh of the expected amount is probably a good thing. Yes. And even the I, I'm with you, the you know, the exact numbers are probably don't mean a lot to to most people listening. But even the rise that we had in 2022 was a lot to do with the Ukrainian war and the you know crisis in Europe having to revert to coal and natural gas. So it would have been even lower if not for, you know, Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Um, so now now we can just blame climate change on Putin, right? Indeed. That like is a the grab point. Bag. Yes. A grab bag. <laughs> anything, anything bad that is going on in the world shall henceforth be the responsibility of Vladimir Putin. 
<laughs> I'm, so, I'm, I'm down for that. So um, be it. So be it resolved. No, seriously. <laughs> it, I think one thing that a lot of people have been missing, including in, I don't know, what should we call it? The climate activist community. And uh, we're soon going to come up on the, uh, the, the, the COP summit in Sharm El Sheikh in, mm. in the coming weeks, the next global climate conclave of which there have been a series over the past 10 plus years, last time in Edinburgh. And there's always been a tension in that world of if you take the, the, the foot off the pedal of urgency and point out progress, maybe people will then relax and not dedicate the energy they need to to changing the way we utilize resources or don't utilize resources. I mean, that being said, I think it's also really important to note where change and progress has been made and not simply focus relentlessly on all the work that remains to be done and what the you know incredibly deleterious consequences might be if that work isn't done. Right. And to know that all this, you know, stuff that we've done pretty recently try to, to try to go after climate change is actually working. Um, right. The other, you know, big number from the International Energy Agency was that we're hitting a new record of um, solar and wind production. I have a feeling that we're going to be hitting new records, quote unquote, of solar and wind production for quite a few years because it's just ramping up. They estimated that the ramp up of solar wind production avoided, and again, a number, but it, if you can compare the numbers against one another, you'll see the point. It avoided 600 million tons of carbon emissions. So we went up 300 million tons and we avoided an additional 600 million from the ramp up of solar and wind. So there are things happening out there. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, as, as someone like Andy McAfee, who's a member of the Progress Network, has pointed out, the more affluent societies become, oddly, the the there, there's sort of a energy intensive resource consumption rises really steeply when you go from sort of low middle income to upper middle income. But once you reach that upper middle income, it starts leveling off and decreasing. So while it's certainly true that Europe and the United States in particular are responsible for a massive amount of climate emissions as affluent societies, you know, relative to sub-Saharan Africa or parts of Asia, once you reach that sort of plateau of development, your energy intensiveness and your resource intensiveness, as you become more digital, as you become more urban, as all these things happen, it actually starts to decrease. And a lot of people don't know, including many countries in Europe and the US, that carbon emissions have been dropping for like 20 years. Right. The reason why globally the carbon emissions keep going up is because there are these developing economies that are trying to play catch up here and are building, 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 you know, including places like China and India and, and those really big major players. But which, which continually say to the, you know, the developed countries, hey, wait a minute, you, you can't tell us that right. we don't get to share in the same level of kind of material affluence that you have just because you've already expended the planet's carbon budget. Right. And so the name of the game is trying to leapfrog those countries from where they are into just clean technology, which I think Bloomberg gave like billions relatively recently to try to make that happen. So we'll have to follow up on that at some point. I expect you to have solved this by next week. <laughs> we expect Bloomberg to have solved this. Come on, that's man. That's right. Billions. Your presidential run trillions. didn't go so well. <laughs> no, did not go so well. But that's a <laughs> subject for another podcast. Yes. Okay, so let's leave the climate for now um, and go to something that is sort of, it's kind of funny to say close to my heart, but it's close to my heart as a birth control taking woman now living in, the, in Europe where you can get birth control over the counter. I think a lot of people will know that the U.S. is sort of an outlier in that, that you need to get a prescription for birth control. And certainly now with the rollback of Roe v. Wade, it's becoming even more important, I think, to take that step to have birth control over the counter. And we might have it for the first time soon. FDA advisors are meeting in the middle of, the, of November um, to make a recommendation if this one particular birth control pill will be prescription or over the counter. Advisors for the FDA have delayed their discussion of a potential over-the-counter birth control pill. Opil is a non-estrogen contraceptive women can take once a day to prevent pregnancy. Right now, it must be prescribed, but Perigo has submitted the drug for over-the-counter approval. Now, if approved, Opil will be the first daily birth control pill available over-the-counter. Perigo said the FDA postponed the meeting so it could review additional information related to the potential move. The, the down side of that upside is it takes the FDA forever to move on these things. There was a recent item in the news, I think you mentioned it at one point, of 
uh, over-the-counter hearing aids finally being mm -hmm. offered, given that you needed a prescription and they would cost you know five, seven thousand dollars, and you'd have to go get tuned up. And now the technology is there to just kind of buy them and set them up on your computer by yourself. But it took the FDA five years from the time that um, this bipartisan bill was passed, partly by Elizabeth Warren, but also with huge Republican support between the time that bill was passed and the time the FDA actually authorized it in August of 2022. So part of this is a call for quicker action on the part of the FDA. I don't know where they are with the, the over-the-counter birth control. Yeah, I think that they, they're expecting a decision in 2023. And I think that has to do with the fact that the pill is supposed to be coming to market then. So they're moving faster than usual. But it's also, like you said, kind of who knows what's going to happen between now and then. And of course, there's the additional special USA hurdle that even if the FDA advises and decides that they can do this over the counter, federal law doesn't require insurance to cover birth control over right. the counter. Yeah, only right. 13 states other... do. Mm -hmm. A whole other issue. Same thing with mm -hmm. the hearing aids. So, you know, that's sort of a a step forward, but with the with the asterisks of we still have an incredibly challenging bureaucracy that is doesn't move nearly as quickly as the need of humans, and um, will leave a lot of people in the lurch in the midterm. But things are clearly moving in the the right direction. Yeah, on the score. Think... Yeah, yeah. I mean, it really should. Or be everyone could just join you in Athens and get everything over the counter. <laughs> Come to Europe, guys. Come to Europe. I get my birth <laughs> control over the counter and it's eight euro. Okay. So I'll just leave it there. And you'll, you'll happily sell it to someone for 12. <laughs> That's right. That's the Greek style for sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Moving on. Let's talk about, you know, something that's fresh, hotly debated. Um, and that I don't think we've talked about yet, which is student loans. So, of course, right now, you know, the, the whole Biden program uh, for $10,000 of relief for Pell grantees is on hold. This morning, the financial future of millions of borrowers in limbo. The president's going to do everything that he can uh, to make sure uh, that we uh, we get this done. The Justice Department filing a response last night trying to reverse an appeals court's temporary stay, which halted President Biden's plan to slash student loan debt. The court sided with six Republican-led states who argue the president is overstepping his authority. Biden's plan would cancel up to $10,000 in federal loans for most borrowers and up to 20,000 for Pell Grant recipients. As of last Friday, 22 million Americans had already applied for forgiveness. But there is a sort of a strange success story that I saw that I really appreciated, which is that the website that the government set up to apply for this student loan relief was really simple and really good. So, uh, you know, this New York Times article had the comparison that the first day that Obamacare was launched, there were six people who successfully got through that process on the Obamacare website. That's in contrast to the 22 million people that successfully negotiated the student loan website um, in the first week that it was open. So yes, well, as we know, the launch of Obamacare at a technology level was one of the most embarrassing, most ludicrous <laughs> launches. And it really showed how antediluvian the government, at least in 2011, was in terms of you know, getting a technology platform along with a piece of legislation. Although, frankly, as we saw in 2020, when all those benefits were being channeled through state websites that were running on programming from the 1980s mm -hmm. um, and ma and mainframe computers, you know, the, the, again, back to our bureaucracies are slow, human needs are quick. So I, I will say, and this is probably, we should do this as a longer conversation, as appealing as a lot of the student loan relief is, I mean, it, there, there is a, a lot of legitimate questions that could be asked about it, you know, meaning, yeah, what about students who paid back their loans, you know, they're not getting credits for the money they spent. What about people who didn't go to college because they didn't want to incur those loans because they didn't assume that they were going to be forgiven. I just think in the in the rush to celebrate this as a needed relief of a lot of really ridiculous debt burdens, it was done, I think, more for electoral gain than really mm. carefully crafted policy. 
Yeah. So I probably should have caveated this whole thing, which which was let's celebrate the uh, successful technology of the thing and not necessarily be for or against the student loan program itself. I am sympathetic to the view that like I'm not even sure if the program is legal. And I am also sympathetic to the view that I think it was it cast too wide of a net. Um, like I know people who are going to get, well, if the relief goes through, I know people who are going to get it and it's going to be super helpful to them. I also know people who are like, yes, you know, give me that cash. And like, they really don't need it. And I also, my biggest bugaboo about this whole thing is that I don't really think it's going to fix the, the, you know, the college system in, in the States, which is really the thing that needs to be fixed. Absolutely. But maybe we should address that at a, at, at greater length in a different episode, given that, these are hot button issues. It's a major program. And, uh, you know, this question of the cost of higher education, the accessibility, should everyone be going to college? Should we demand a college mm -hmm. degree for a lot of things? These are all open questions. There, one, there is one, you know, sort of little story around this, which I think I think that everybody can get behind, which is that they amended a little bit the rules around the public service loan forgiveness program. This is another student loan news, but definitely one that's gotten submerged in, in other bigger news. It used to be a really sort of intense qualifications. You know, if you made a payment that was a few cents short or a few days late, they would basically knock you out of the program, even let's say if you had cancer. And this is a program where if you're a nonprofit or a government worker, if you pay for 10 years your student loans, the government will release you from your remaining loan balance at the end. So apparently it was like a very easy program to, to mess up if you're, if you're part of it. And they've made some adjustments now, which means that more people are going to be able to get what they're supposed to be getting out of that. That would be good. You know, law, particularly for professional degrees for public service, right? So if you're if you go to a law school, which give very little financial aid, that's where you often see these egregious debt balances. Although, again, if you're going to go into corporate law, you're likely to be able to manage that debt load. If you're going to become a public defender, you can't. Right. And so it's a it's differentiating between if you've got one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in uh, law school loans and you want to be a public servant with that. Uh, legal aid, aid for immigrants, you know, you name it. Mm. It just, it, it doesn't add up unless you have money on the side. So again, distinguishing between need, I think that's what we talked alluded to before with the program. It's a very broad brush. There's a lot of specific areas that need remediation. That doesn't mean the entire thing needs um, loan forgiveness. But again, controversial, I'm sure a lot of people disagree and it's worth considering continuing that particular conversation. Yep. And people can let us know if you want to hear that conversation. Our inbox is open. So we have one more little piece of news just to follow up on our marijuana beat since we've been, <laughs> we've been hitting it a couple of times. And uh, we've been hitting it, huh? We've yeah. been hitting or even token, <laughs> you know, here and there. But uh, Germany is planning to legalize recreational, re 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 recreational, I've been hitting it already, apparently. <laughs> Germany is planning to legalize recreational cannabis uh, in 2024, which would make them uh, only Malta so far in the EU has totally legalized it. This plan from Germany goes further even than the Netherlands. And to be honest, I wasn't expecting that from Germany. So there you go. And how does that compare to state legalization in the U.S.? About the same? I mean, me, meaning Germany will be nationally equivalent to Colorado? Yes, I believe that that's the case. I, I have to look at the specifics. I know, for example, that Germany will allow three at-home cannabis plants per adult. And for instance, I don't know what you're allowed to do in Colorado, you know, per mm. cannabis plants. But I think um, more important, which we talked about with uh, Senator Hertzberg, the banking part, meaning making it le a legal business, which it yes. still is not at a federal level in the United States. And that creates all sorts of problems for distribution. You can't sell across state boundaries. You can't use banks. I mean, it's it's legal-ish in the United States. Yes. So Germany is going to be a legal, full-fledged legal business. And um, they're also maybe looking into laws around regulating the intensity of the THC for under 21-year-olds. So that was the other thing that we had brought up as a potential oh, caveat before. That's yeah. good. So the Germans are on it. Dust smoke. <laughs> Dust smoke. So that's all for today. We're going to, we're going to, the, on that, on that high note. <laughs> <laughs> the puns the puns <laughs> oh they're just they're just coming fast and loose we will 
I hope join you all next week, or rather we will join, but I hope you join us next week and listen to some of the episodes you may not have and check out the What Could Go Right newsletter, which is part of the Progress Network and is weekly and is free, but you have to go onto theprogressnetwork.org and sign up for it. And check out our new TikTok. What's the TikTok address, Emma? Progress N T W R K. So network without the vowels. Yeah. So we are Progress Network without the vowels. Well, Progress has the vowels, Network doesn't. Yes. That's and, right. <laughs> uh, and you can see Emma do her TikToks. That's right. <laughs> for better or for worse. <laughs> Thank you all. We'll talk to you next week. Thank you.